Good afternoon, Blair Underwood. We have the award-winning actor, producer, and director who has been in the industry more than 30 years. And so we're just so honored <laughs> that you are taking the time to chat with us. We are going to get into all things, you know, your health and fitness routine, uh, what success means to you, your career longevity. So with so many accolades under your belt, how do you define success? Well, first of all, Don Terry, it's great to see you again. I know we did an interview. Uh, you told me 2014, I believe it was. <laughs> um, as I said, the before time, before COVID, before, <laughs> before so much has changed. But anyway, it's great to see you again. So how do I define success? I, you know, I would say it's different for everybody. But to me, I think if you can do what you love and you can uh, monetize it without selling out your soul and integrity and without breaking the laws, being moral, ethical, and you can be of service to people and give back and you're happy and doing all those things, that's success to me. I brought up a few good points. One, you said if you're happy. So also, what does happiness mean to you? You know, again, I, you know, I reference it because we're all living it. I say the before times, you know, uh, you know, just dealing with the pandemic and, and working through that as we all have the last year or two. I think definition of happiness has become, for me anyway, much more um, imperative to define what happiness is, what true happiness is. And, and to me, it's being able to live with yourself, being able to uplift uh, other people around you. That comes under the umbrella of service. But also, I mean, really, it's, it's like that, that metaphor of being on a plane where they tell you, give yourself the oxygen mask first before you give it to your kids because you have to be in control of yourself and before you can help others. So I think it's important to know what, what makes you tick, what makes you work, what makes you happy, what, how do you need to be loved? How do you need to be seen? What's important to you? In those respects, um, all of that I think is is mission critical to understand about yourself. And if you can do that, that that's a path to happiness. I say that because again, you know, we we, we realize and learn that uh, it's not always so easy to access happiness or joy. For some of us, it is. But the reality, when people are dealing with certain things, stressors, tension, um, the things we've all been dealing with, I just see it a lot around me. You know, people are we're managing. You know, it's above and beyond. It's just uh, let's be happy and, and fun. That's great. I live in a positive place, but it's not always easy to maintain and sustain a state of, of happiness or joy. It definitely isn't, especially like you said, with everything going, in, going on in the world today. Um, but you also mentioned something else earlier in terms of coming from a place of integrity. I mm. recently uh, just spoke on a panel and I said that was part of a lot of opportunities um, that have come my way, just me working from a place of integrity. And I think that also speaks to you as well with your career longevity. You know, and that's how so many opportunities are coming your way. That's why three decades later, you're still in the game. You're still at the top of your game. So that just speaks a lot to your character and your hard work ethic and everything. So kudos. To I you. appreciate that. You know, I tell you, integrity is part and parcel to longevity. If you want to understand how somebody can have longevity, you got to have some kind of standards, um, standards and, and, and limits um, and, and integrity to whatever the work. I mean, what does integrity mean? Is It means I... There's a certain bar of, of, of game that I want to maintain and aspire to and, and live in that space. And it's, it's always, I've tried to live by that my whole career. When I was just a young, young pup getting in the game, I, I remember hearing Denzel Washington years ago in an interview say, you always, as a young artist, or as anybody, at any point in your life and career, you always have the right to say no. You always have the right to say no. So you have you have a certain uh, agency over yourself. Um, nobody's putting a gun to your head to do whatever you want to do. So if you can if you can do that, that's how you that's how you kind of access and maintain integrity to say no, I don't want to do that. I mean, actually, my career is more defined by the things I've said no to than the things I've said yes to. But that's you know, there's a lot to that. I got a buddy of mine who's my, my, my producing partner for years, and he always laughs about that. He said, "Man, you know, every time you'd have a show be canceled, I'd be like, man, I hate, I love that show, man, I can't believe they 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 canceled that show." And you're like dude i've moved on i turned the corner so we talk about that a lot how do you how do you do that you know how do you how do you just turn the corner so fast it's not about being apathetic it's not about not caring it's about caring and 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 having perspective to understand the industry and the business not just the craft as an actor you know now that i produce and direct there's more a sense of understanding all the different moving pieces and variables that come into casting anyone or keeping a show on the air or financing a movie or financing a play whatever it is they're multiple innumerable factors that come into play. It was not just my little ego that wants to, to uh, keep a role or to stay on the shore, keep a show on the air. So if you understand that, it really helps you kind of just stay in that, that space of it ain't personal. Let's move on. Keep it, keep it moving, keep it pushing. So would you say that's a part of your approach to living your best life? 
in terms of not holding on to things, letting it go, uh, releasing the expectations of something. And Montana, you're really good. You ask great questions. I, I absolutely think, I don't think that I know that. You know, I'm an army brat. So my dad is a retired uh, army colonel and I grew up on army bases and military bases. Um, I say that to say I had a very nomadic child life. We're always nomads. We're always staying in places temporarily. You know, we're always a new kid on the block. We get in school. So you you learn to you learn to do just that to kind of just encapsulate what this meaning is in this moment. What is this season of life? And 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 really delve into that. Sink into it. Live. Immerse yourself into it. And then let it go. So I know for a fact that my childhood and and the ways in which we were raised, um, in the context of just being constantly moving from place to place, new new school, new neighborhoods, had a lot to do with as as an adult being able to to not just let things go because sometimes people don't deal with stuff. When I say immerse yourself in it, I mean deal with this moment, whatever the moment is, and then let it go. My my son when he was in kindergarten, my oldest son Paris. Uh, well, he was actually in sixth grade. He was moving to seventh grade, a new school, a new building. And all he knows, you know, I was moving around a lot, but all they know is California, same home, same neighborhood. And he was having problems emotionally, just kind of moving from his elementary school to his junior high school. And I, I said, you know, one of the tricks I've always done was to physicalize the, the emotion of leaving. So I'd actually go to those physical spaces, whether it was a home or a school. And in this case, I took him to his school. We walked through his school, uh, starting in the kindergarten room where he started in kindergarten. I went to every classroom up until sixth grade, uh, specifically with the sole intent to say goodbye to that physical space, to bring closure to that physical space. And by doing that, it helped the emotional. So I say that to say, when I talk about just letting go, it ain't just letting go, I don't care, because that stuff can creep up on you. If you're not dealing with certain emotions, but if you just really face it full frontal, dive in, say goodbye, bring closure to it. I found for me, it's been easy to kind of move on and build and grow and keep it, keep it moving. If you could talk to a younger version of yourself, what would you say? <laughs> what are you thinking? No. Um, what would I say to my younger version of myself? I would say, um, you know, probably don't take yourself too seriously, that it's going to be okay, and continue to create bonds with people. You know, I'm 57 now, and a lot of my friends, I, I lost my mother. She transitioned to October 2020. So many of my friends' parents are now gone as we are in our mid to late fifties. So I, I see a lot of that sense of just yesterday, a friend of mine's mother passed away and uh, she's dealing with that. You know, it's just, it's just, you become more experienced, you become more mature. And if you're paying attention, you become wiser and deeper of, of understanding how life works. Uh, even though we still live in a great mystery of life, what is life, why is life? Understanding that it's, everything is temporary. No matter how wonderful it is or terrible it is, it's temporary. Well, this is this is a little personal for me because I actually lost my mom. Uh, I'm to hear that. So thank you. So uh, just trying to find um, joy in the pain um, and just realizing that although she's not here physically, we're closing out that physical chapter. Me and her are so like spiritually connected and just finding the gratitude in our relationship and then extending beyond this earthly platform. No, it's so, so well said. That's so well said. And, you know, to be able to do that, because I never, I never lost anybody that close to me, except my cousin Lynn, who two years ago passed away, you know, a parent. And I think if you can really understand that these relationships are fleeting, as you mentioned, the, the physical connections are fleeting. So while you have it, and this is the lesson to answer your question, what I would tell my younger self, make sure you do, and I've tried to my whole life, but even more so, just pay attention to those moments, pay attention to those relationships, build those relationships, because they're not going to always necessarily be here. And we're not going to, well, they won't, and we won't. We all have an expiration date. And we all got to check out at a certain point. So make the most of it while you can. Sound like a bumper sticker or a Hallmark card, but it's true. You've lived it. I've lived it. And the older we get, the more we see my dad is 89. He's one of the last remaining people of his generation, of his contemporaries. So it's a different level of, he's a positive person. But it's a different level of, of having lived such a full life. And so many of those relationships are now memories. You know, those people are no longer with us. Uh, so it's important. I would tell my younger self to just, just, just know that and not to be de depressed or sad about it, but just more, make the most of these lived experiences while we have them. For sure. Coming from a place of gratitude. I think that's where I learned um, in terms of just dealing with my mom's passing. I'm just so grateful. We had, like, I had her physically for those 29 years. I'm still grateful, you know, so just coming from a, a space of gratitude. Uh, you said that, that word four times. That's the one word I use all the time when people ask, how are you doing? You know, just with respect to my mother's passing. And I say just that. I have to live in a state of gratitude. 
-hmm. And easier said than done, but you're, you're obviously there now, which is great. I try to live in that space. You know, there's a lot to be sad for, but to, to the sense of gratitude to know that I believe God blessed that person. I was honored to have this person that God showed as my mother, to have her for as long as I did. So, so that sense of gratitude, I think, is, is imperative to, to wrap yourself in. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that was actually going to be in terms of the next question. I, I felt you... that, though. I felt that. So I thought I'd just jump ahead. I was going to say, but I feel like you already covered that. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the, it was the recent anniversary of your film debut, Crush Groove. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 36 years. I had not done the math, but thank you. That's good to know. I didn't know if you wanted me to put it out there, but I just did, just in case. Right, listen, I am not like that. I don't care. You can say it's 100 years. I'm probably still be kicking and doing what I'm doing. So it okay, could be 100 so I'm good with that. Like, Why did you say that? So no, just that to sure. no, I, that doesn't bother me. Uh, so looking back, what would you say that moment or that film taught you about yourself during that particular time? I think the biggest thing it taught me was that um, this thing is possible. This thing, this pursuit of having a career in show business is possible. I was uh, a year out of college. So I was 22, 20, no, 21. Is that right? Yeah, about 21 when that happened. And it's a crapshoot. The one mantra I heard more than anything when I left Petersburg, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia, to move to Hollywood, move to, you know, to try show business was that only 3% of actors make a living at this. And that's a statistic through Screen Actors Guild, our, our union. Only 3% actually make a living. And I had many people tell me that, and be careful, have a backup plan. And you know, you, you may not make it, you probably won't, won't make it. Not my family, my parents were always so supportive, and my siblings too, but just other people who, many of them had tried it and, and it didn't work for them. So this was their experience. And I had to, I had to remind myself, just that. And I mean, sometimes I'd get irritated. I'd say, don't put that on me. That's that's your walk and that's okay, but don't put that on me. A lot of times it's well-meaning, but and then there's the other component and you're an African-American actor. You know, I, I started in the mid eighties. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't post 2020. It wasn't where we are right now where diversity is the thing. You know, there's always that, that aspect that, you know, and you're minority, minority. So you probably won't have a lot of opportunities for employment. So I just had, you know, I had to just take my shot and just glad it, glad it worked out the way it did. Well, I'm glad you didn't allow other people's uh, misconceptions or their viewpoints, you know, deter you from pursuing your dreams because, no. yeah, that can, you know, self-doubt can start lingering in and critical thinking and imposter syndrome, like, well, maybe they were right if you didn't land that first role or, you know, you're getting rejection after rejection. No, you're right. You're right. And, I, you know, I, tr I try to prepare myself for that. Because if, if you know anything about, you know, if you're going to get into something, you should do some studying, you should you know, bone up on what the industry is. And one of the things that's just common sense about this industry is that nothing is guaranteed and that most, you know, the chances of you being successful are slim to none. So I knew that walking into it. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm, I'm grateful it worked out the way it did, but you just, you never, you never know, but you have to gird up to be ready for the rejection. So, you know, back to your question, when Crush Group happened, it was just a, a great infuser of confidence to say, maybe maybe this is the right thing for me to be doing. I feel like that's, that's also a part of life. Nothing in life is guaranteed. So that's right. you have to fall in. <laughs> right, this is exactly right. And that was my take when people say, it was not guaranteed, it's a tough business. Yeah, well, life is tough. You know, I see you with your hat. I love the paintings in the background. So we, we got to get, you know, a little bit into your personal style. So in three to five words, uh -oh. How would you describe your personal style? Three, confident, casual, cool. <laughs> I love it. So and three to five. Yes. Okay. And I could, you know what? I totally see it. Cool, confident, and casual. Casual. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, there was a time, this speaks about getting a world, and I wouldn't say I'm, I'm cool. People may misinterpret. He said he's cool. I don't even worry about that stuff anymore because cool is feeling comfortable in your own skin. And to be casual, I don't, you know, I, I can get dressed up. I can turn up if I have to. I just don't always necessarily like to turn. I'd rather be in a t-shirt and jeans as I am right now. This is 90% of the time. And, um, and, and confident, confident. I think the best confidence is, is um, interwoven with humility. You know, humility is important. Co confidence absent humility is arrogance. Arrogance is one of the things I hate more than anything. I despise arrogance in people and don't have tolerance for it. You know, it's one of the things I talk about a lot is now a director and, you know, in the places of leadership in, in my my industry, um, it's one thing I won't put up with on, on a set or, um, you know, in the work environment is confidence, is arrogance. So to be confident, to be casual, and to be cool, um, I think best describes the way I aspire to be, at least. So you don't feed into the pride or the, e or the ego, you? 
if you approach life in this industry mm -hmm. in its entirety. You know, why get arrogant and cocky because you had a hit movie or a hit TV show or a great review? Because you'll get the bad reviews and you'll get the bombs, you'll get the, the balance of life. So no, I, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see and don't have any use for overconfidence and arrogance because I mean, especially <laughs> if you understand this industry, there are so many people on one project that makes that make that work. There are about 200 people behind the scenes of every project you do. We're doing the Zoom right now. There are like four or five other people on the Zoom. No, you don't do any one thing by yourself. You're the, the interviewer right now. I'm the interviewee. So we get to be in the limelight. We're out front. But there are always people behind the scenes. And I, I, I just have too much respect for the process of what we, that was what we do and what people do in general um, when they're, when they're um, working toward making a living or working toward expressing their craft and their artistry um, or working toward just a paycheck just to, to, to get by. I have respect for the, the, the work ethic and hard work. And if you see that, there's no room for arrogance because it's just it's all smoke and mirrors and temporary and fleeting. For sure. I actually uh, just told somebody that the other day. Um, I had one of my uh, interviews up and they're like, oh, you know, you're doing this. I'm like, it wasn't just me. Trust me. It was a whole <laughs> <laughs> process. And there's a lot of different people. You just seeing the end results. And it's not just me. And like you said, and the person I'm interviewing or just us in conversation. Yeah. So many moving parts behind it and so many people involved to bring this to fruition. So. You have such a great mindset, but also within that, hopefully you can still find that space to say thank you because you had to do your part. True. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Matt Usher and Tony behind the scenes, but you know, you, you're the one, you got the hair and makeup, got this painted down, you got to present and got to do that job. That is true. Look, I, love, I love you guys too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I am curious, you know, aside from Blair Underwood, the award-winning actor, producer, and director, can you tell us something about people wouldn't necessarily know about you from a quick Google search? No, let me think about that. What I, what people want to uh, Google search. Um, I, yeah. I don't know. I, have to, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that, to be honest with you. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay. That's totally right. not. <laughs> you know, with all the scripts you have to choose from, what was three women's attraction for you? Three women um, was based, it, it's based on a book by Lisa Tadeo. It was, it was a number one best-selling international bestseller. It speaks to three different women, three disparate lives. In the book, the series is really about four women. It's the three women and their lives do interconnect in the series. It's a 10 episode series for Showtime. And the fourth person is actually that author inspired by Lisa Tadeo that interviews those three and brings them all together. So what I think what, uh, what appealed to me was the fact that it was Showtime, that it was um, the Wanda Wise plays my wife. She's one of the three women. So I play her husband, I'm just one of the guys. In the, in the show, it's their story. But also, I mean, honestly, people I respect uh, were strong advocates for it. My agent, especially, he's like, you got to do this. And I was like, mm. I mean, it's showtime. I mean, I would tell you, it's very racy. I mean, I did some of that on Sex and the City and some other independent films. So it's not it's not unfamiliar to me, but it's some racy stuff. So I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that, number one. Uh, and there's certain things, again, integrity, certain things I don't want to do, certain things I won't do. So he said, we'll just talk to the, the creator. So Laura Easton is the showrunner, Lisa Tadeo is the showrunner, uh, now executive producer and writer. Uh, so after my conversation with them, um, and they heard me out of what I, I was not willing to do, um, we found middle ground and I, I, I was on board. But partially because it's it speaks to, if you look, read any of the reviews, speaking of Google, if you Google three women, and the book, it's, it's, I'm not a woman, obviously, but it's so many women said it speaks to a, a, a sense of, of freedom and openness uh, in a time in, that came out in 2019, you know, where we are in this world. And I was surprised, but I asked a number of women, I said, you know, I, I read these interviews, I read the reviews of this book. I said, weren't we doing that in the seventies? I mean, free love and free openness and, and way beyond that in the 1990s and 2000s, like, but it's a different thing. I, Lisa today, today also said this to me. She said, the thing is, we feel as though, which we see in, in race relations, voting rights right now, but as women, it feels like with Roe versus Wade, every time we take three steps forward, um, society or what have you takes two steps back. So there's always a fight for identifying oneself and saying, this is who we are. And, and, and we have our own strength and powers and, and agency of self and, and we can determine and dictate and define who we are as women. So, you know, it's been an education to me. It's, it's, it's so heavily woman oriented and dominated. I mean, that's really the whole, the production staff is like 90% women. The, the crew is about 80% women. Um, so, so I love it, but uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an education to me. I'm learning. I try to learn with every project I do. 
Yeah, that's good that you're still learning, still evolving. The only change in life is constant. So the fact that, Ooh, that true. so taking on projects that sort of teach you something about yourself or just sort of open your eyes to a different perspective. That's right. That's exactly right. You know, what do you hope to capture in the minds of audiences with the rebooted version of L.A. Law? Yeah, yeah. We start shooting that in March um, and I'm excited about it because, you know, L.A. Law was the the break that gave me, it, that was a show that gave me my break in the 90s. I was 23 when that show started. And um, I hope that people will, you know, those people that remember the old show, the original show will, uh, will still be entertained and, and, and reminisce and, and you'll see a lot of similar feelings and tones and, and, and story, storytelling style, different stories. It's a new time and place. Corbin Bernstein is returning as, is, as am I and my character. Uh, the rest of the cast will be kind of filled out by a lot of millennials and new faces and, and, and young lawyers and the like. So I'm excited about that. I'm excited. You know, L.A. Law at its best was touched a lot of nerves and was very controversial and pushed a lot of boundaries. So I hope to do the same thing. You know, the balance of LA Law at its best was quirkiness and comedy and levity and drama and high drama. It's, it's billed as, it's an hour drama. But, um, you know, Stephen Bochco, who created the show with Terry Louise Fisher, then David Kelly took over, you know, a couple of years later, they weren't afraid to go to the quirky and juxtapose it to the drama, so dramatic. So we're, gonna, we're doing the same thing and I'm excited about that. So with so many projects under your belt, and I know each one is different, how do you go, like, what is your process in terms of preparation or getting in that mindset or framework of taking on a new character or a new role? Yeah, I think that mindset started with my, my childhood. Again, being that kid, you just, you, you kind of coach, code switch, you know, code switch, you're an actor here. Okay, now you're a director. I just finished directing a movie in July. I'm editing right now my, my second feature film called Viral and just editing and directing and, you know, editing and acting and directing at the same time. You just put different hats on, but you learn to kind of compartmentalize those things. You know, my, my approach is just really delving into whatever, uh, delving in 100% to whatever that character or that job title needs at the time mm -hmm. and trying to balance, you know, just day-to-day -day life, you know, so you can <laughs> have a sense of happiness and balance in life and not be overstressed and overwhelmed by too many things at once. Because sometimes you can take on too much, but it's really learned, I found for me, I've, it's really so much about learning how to delegate when you can and focus, laser focus on the things you need to laser focus. Like for instance, like I said, I'm editing my film. I've been going, burning the midnight oil with my editor, Javon's, uh, for the film the last two weeks. And I wanted to take off today because I wanted to do this soon. I didn't want to be in the editing bay, you know, focused on that right now. And, but I needed that little getaway just to kind of balance it and just kind of clear your mind and get back to it tomorrow. Fresh new eyes, fresh mindset. Fresh new eyes, that's right. <laughs> and tackle this tomorrow. <laughs> right. Now with the recent passing of Sidney Portier, how has his legacy impacted or influenced you? Mr. Portier, the, the, the adjectives and the words you often hear given to him are elegance, integrity, um, brilliant. You know, when he came along in the early 1960s to see that image on television and the movies, in his case, was unheard of. He wasn't the first Black actor to come along. Um, there was James Edwards before him and, um, I mean, so many step and fetch it. There was Amos and Andy, but they were, they were a different breed of representation of the, the African-American man, the black man. So for him to come along and be able to project and present that image, it made us proud as a people. So when I came along as a kid, I looked at those movies like In the Heat of the Night and To Sir With Love and um, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Paris Blue. And I, I'd see this, this, this man, this black man who reminded me of my father, actually. You know, and I said, I wanna be like that. We're not about imitating him at all, but in terms of what he represented um, that made us proud as a people to say, I want to, I want to, I admire that sense of self, sense of presence to walk on the screen and not be intimidated by anybody on that screen within the context and confines of the world and the story we're telling, but also as the actor working on that set. Now you can tell, I mean, in the heat of the night, people often refer to this, there's that scene in, uh, in the heat of the night where he's in a, a nursery, uh, a greenhouse. And this man, this white man comes up to him and slaps him. And Cindy Portier was in the script. He said, well, here's the deal. If he slaps me, I'm gonna slap him back. This was the 1960s. And uh, it was a slap heard around the world. You know, so it's one, it's one of the things we talk about to this day because we didn't see that at the time. So his legacy, that's part of his legacy, his professional legacy. And, um, and I'm just grateful that for whatever reason, he, he availed himself to me very early on in my career and, 
and showed me great support, as he did with many other actors. But, you know, almost every major turn in my career, he was there. I did a one-man show called I Am Four on stage 20 years ago now, and he was there in the front row in a little 99-seat theater, you know, and, and he just always was was there. The one, I haven't even talked about this much, but I was doing The Trip to Bountiful five, six years ago with starring Cicely Tyson and Vanessa Williams, and uh, we, uh, Cuba Gooding played my part on Broadway. Then I did the tour with uh, Cicely Tyson and Vanessa Williams. Uh, and we also did the film, the film version of it that came on Lifetime. And, and Mr. Portier wanted to come see the show. And I didn't tell Miss Tyson because uh, he wanted to surprise her. So we were doing a, the show in Los Angeles and he came backstage afterwards. And right when he came off, Vanessa, Vanessa Williams and I would always carry her off, carry Miss Tyson off. And as soon as we came off, he was standing there and the two of them just jumped, I mean, literally jumped up and down to see each other. And, and one of them said, said, we're still here. We're still here. So um, I feel so grateful to have, to have um, been able to forge relationships with two of my mentors, two of the people I looked up to from afar when I was just a young kid who wanted to act and say, I, I, I want to play roles like Sissy Tyson. You know, she did the autobiography, Miss Jane Pittman. Um, uh, if you haven't seen that, you, you can definitely check that out. But she aged from 30 to 100 years old. The autobiography, Miss Jane Pittman. I said, I want to do that one day. And later on, I had the chance to do Mama Flora's Family with her alongside her. Where I played her son in that one. Um, where I got to play from 15 to 50. So I'm just, I'm just grateful. I mean, you talk about gratitude and joy. I, I feel that every single day. And I feel their, the loss. You know, we lost them both in the last, in the last one, Mr. Portier recently and Mr. Tyson within the last eight eight months so it's a long answer and that's why i had to take my time there's a lot to be said for what did he mean to me there's this professional legacy but there's also the the personal legacy i mean he taught me how to deal you know it's not easy you know when when celebrity is new but it's it's thrust upon you and i was 22 23 when la law happened and it just changed my life and all of a sudden you know you walk down the street people start to recognize you and i didn't know how to really deal with that and i remember one of the first conversations i had with mr portier he said just focus on the work focus on the work and let that be your your driving force. So you're not you're not you're not feeling a need to cultivate fandom. You're not feeling a need to. This is before social media. Feeling a need to just make sure people love you and and send fan mail and now Instagram and social media. So I you know I do social media a little bit because I have to have it in a long time. But it's for that reason because the focus should be just do the work. The best thing you owe owe your public is your work between action and cut, and from the time the curtain goes up when the curtain comes down. Now, that said, he also taught me how to interact with people. That I also got from my parents as well, but I never saw him once say no to an autograph. Um, so to be as giving and selfless uh, as he was, I learned from that. And that's all, all part of his legacy. It's not a long answer to your question there, Don Terry. <laughs> But I loved every minute of it, every second of it. We have so many beautiful memories with both of them. But I was also going to say back to our earlier point, Mr. Portier, he also understood the power of no in terms of turning down certain roles that didn't align with what he stood for um, and right. what he wanted to contribute to his legacy. That's exactly so, right. That's, mm -hmm. He set standards. And then, you know, because I, I looked up to him as that standard bearer, sometimes to be a standard bearer, or to set a, a level of expectations and to lead by example. There's certain things you, he had to say no to more things than I have to say no to because he said no to so much. And he told me that in no uncertain terms. I did a film in 1994 called Just Cause, Sean Connery, Lawrence Fishburne, 10 year old Scarlett Johansson. And in that film, Lawrence Fishburne, I think I mentioned, yeah, in that film, I played a serial killing pedophile. But you think I'm this nice kid. Lawrence Fishburne plays this cop who is the, uh, just, just uh, you think he's just a jerk and just mean spirited and all that. But it turns out he was the good guy because he was right. He saw something in my character that was wrong. So everything was flipped. And I wanted to play that role. And I was, I, I was talking to Mr. Portier about that. I said, I, I was offered this big role. It's Warner Brothers, it's a big studio film. And, but I don't know. I mean, to, you know, to play a serial killing pedophile, I'm a black man. And, and he basically, he, he literally said to me, he said, there has to come a time when we should be able to play all kinds of roles and not apologize for it. He said, I didn't have, I didn't have that option when I was coming along. And he said, I went through that so you wouldn't have to. So you play that role and you play it well. So I never forgot that. So, so we have much more freedom now than, than he did and his contemporaries in the 1960s and 70s. I'm talking about Billy Dee Williams, and Diana, Diana Ross, and uh, sorry, uh, Ruby Dee and Ozzy Davis. So many of the, that generation, they didn't have the luxury that we have now. Um, so I think there's still a place for integrity. There's still a place for limits and responsibility and respect. 
We can't just we can't just be wretched is what I'm saying. We can't be ratchet just because we can. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Ooh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that one. That part. That, part. that one. That part. <laughs> and you know, speaking of legacy, what does the next chapter for Blair Underwood hold? No, but what I can tell you is the next chapter of of my life uh, professionally is is doing more of what I really want to do. It's pushing the envelope. It's challenging myself like I've never been challenged before. Uh, more directing never to forego acting. Uh, part of the reason I want to direct and produce is so I can hire myself if nobody else is hiring me. So uh, definitely that. And, um, you know, we'll see. My kids are, my youngest kid is 20. My kids are 23, 24, and 20, uh, 20, 20, 20, 20, 23, 24. So they're not kids anymore. So part of the next chapter of my life is, um, you know, seeing where that takes, I don't know, seeing where that takes me just on a, on, a, on a personal level, but in terms of the last 20 years of focus, which was raising these kids and that construct of family, um, it's a different season right now. So, so we'll see. But what I can tell you is that there'll be challenges that I, I delve into head first. I love being challenged. I love being pushed uh, to do the things I've never done before um, because you, you come out on the other side stronger and better for it. I want to ask you one question, a little off scripts, but you brought up your children. You're going off script now. Okay. <laughs> but you brought up your kids and, you know, we didn't talk about them and just, you you know, your fatherhood role. And a lot of times when we talk about parenting, we often ask the parents, you know, what do you want to teach your children? But I'm curious, on the opposite end of the spectrum, what have your children taught you? Out of the mouths of babes, right? I, I constantly listen to them. You know, their generation is much more free and open and accepting and tolerant of other people, other races, other cultures, other uh, perspectives. So I learn from them. I do. I learn from them a lot on things they they will accept or won't accept, um, and why. And there is there is a benefit in that. And I think there's a way to do it without losing yourself. Because sometimes when you accept everything, you know, I think Martin Luther King said, if you if if you won't stand for anything, you'll fall for. It. If you won't stand for anything, you'll fall for everything. You'll stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's right. That's right. Um, so you have to stand for something and you have to have parameters of what, you know, what, the, what you'll live within. But what I learned from them is a certain sense of acceptance of people who are different than them, uh, which is which is a beautiful thing. They're all dialed into their generation of, of music, of pop culture. I often check in with them. You know, we're doing this reboot of L.A. Law that I'm more involved in as a produ executive producer. So I'm constantly asking them, so what do you think about this? What's your take on this? And the film, that, everything I do, I, I, I respect their opinion um, because they are a different generation. So I, I, I want to hear what they have to say and what they're feeling. I, um, I'm just always curious um, just about that, you know, parent, the parenting dynamics, because I feel like as I'm getting older, I'm learning my father from a whole different perspective. <laughs> I, I bet. Yeah. I bet. I'm sure. I'm mm -hmm. sure. It's that cycle of life, right? Right. If you're paying attention. And this is actually my last question. Um, you know, new you is all about health. So what is your health and fitness routine? What does that consist of or look like? <laughs> you know, a friend of mine inspired me years ago. And I'd be walking around the city of New York sometimes. And every time we, I might come out of a train station, she would run up the steps, run up the steps, run up the steps. Uh, so for the last four or five years, part of my regimen, because I can't always get to a gym, can't always do the thing I need to do. But if I see a, a stairwell or steps, I just run up those steps. Um, so that's that. I mean, really, it sounds like a, a minor thing, but it keeps it keeps your heart rate going. Um, it's, it's it's good all around. So but that and I try to watch what I eat, but um, I'm not fanatical about it. You know, five times out of the week, five days out of the week, you know, weekdays, I try to do right for the most part. Um, I let everything go on uh, on the weekends. Like we're talking about balance, you know, so I'm not counting calories, doing whatever else. But, you know, again, the order that you get, if you want to stay fit, it's easier to maintain than to lose yourself and try to get it back. So part of that is working out. Of course, Omega XL, you know, I take every day. Somebody said the other day, say, yeah, we see Omega XL commercial all the time in Trinidad. And, you know, they're asking, like, are you, do you really believe in that or do you take it? I'm like, first of all, that's an insult back to integrity. I'm not going to do anything I don't believe in. I'm not going to tell people I do it if I don't believe in it. But I do. I take it every day. I take four pills every day. And, I find it works for me in terms of, of joints and primarily joints. Um, so I continue to continue to take that. Um, that's helpful. I started intermittent fasting, to be honest with you, part of my process. I basically, so what does that mean? Basically, I, I don't eat for 16 hours, but I eat for eight hours. But long story short, I just don't eat breakfast. Just cut out breakfast. And um, I found I don't really need it. You know, I, I drink a lot of water in the morning. I drink a, a cup of tea. And then when I eat, I try to eat right and then try to exercise when I can. I try to do it like three times a week. For me, I'm starting to incorporate greens into every meal that I have. Make sure I have something green or leafy because before, 
Yeah, I think I was just doing like carbs and sometimes I have green, but literally every meal I need to have something green. Well, this was such a treat. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Oh, yeah. It. And congratulations on everything. Super thank excited you. for this next chapter. Oh, Dante, I appreciate you and thank you. You're excellent at what you do and just uh, keep doing your thing.